Channing Way at Durant. There's wheelchair access. Advanced tickets are $12 at the best independent bookstores or through brownpapertickets.com. Please find full information on kpfa.org. For Chris Hedges, May 2nd, The World As It Is. And this is 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. It is 1.30, and up next is Making Contact. This week on Making Contact. There were a lot of people hoping to vote for me, but were surprised to find that they no longer lived in the assembly district that they had been living in for years, if not decades. Broken politics can be pretty rough, but that move was gangster. Every 10 years, states across the country draw new lines around your neighborhood. Those lines determine who you can vote for, for school board, city council, and even Congress. Well, a town called Anamosa, Iowa, where a man won a city council seat with just two write-in votes. He wasn't a candidate. He didn't vote for himself. In fact, he didn't even know he was running for office. On this edition, we dive into the world of redistricting. Who draws the lines? Why does it matter? And how can the process be fairer? I'm Andrew Stelzer. And I'm Kyungjin Lee. And this is Making Contact, a program connecting people, vital ideas, and important information. If you've ever looked at a congressional or city council district map, you might notice the many funny and irregular shapes. Your school board district may look like a pair of headphones or a teapot. Your state assembly district may be a squiggly line that crosses through your entire town but excludes your neighbor across the street. Have you ever wondered how those lines are created? Every state makes up its own rules on how to redistrict. Some states use political or independent commissions to redraw lines. But 37 states rely on their state legislature. This practice has been criticized as an inherent conflict of interest because politicians already in office can use the redistricting process to protect their power base. It's called gerrymandering. Miriam Webster defines gerrymandering like this. To divide an area into political units to give special advantage to one group. This means intentionally creating districts to favor a particular racial group, political party, or candidate. Is gerrymandering legal? How does it play out? And how does it affect us? The film Gerrymandering reveals the ins and outs of the practice. In this clip from the movie, you'll hear voices including President Obama, Republican Party campaign consultant Ed Rollins, Justin Levitt from New York University's Brennan Center for Justice, and Susan Lerner from Common Cause, New York. As a consequence of the gerrymandering of congressional districts, uh, people aren't being illogical when they stay at home because the outcome is a foregone conclusion. Lines never happen by accident. Every line is carefully conceived. It is the most effective way of manipulating elections short of outright fraud. Why stuff about to draw districts? The system was structured 220 years ago by people who were landowners. They were very significant people, obviously, our forefathers. But it was not to have a democracy. It was really to basically ensure that the, the best and the brightest control the political process. The myth of democracy is that. It's a myth. In the redistricting process, it's really a war. And you have a lot of weapons in your arsenal. You can talk about racial gerrymandering, where gerrymandering might favor whites. You can talk about partisan gerrymandering, where the lines are drawn to favor a particular political party, the Democrats or the Republicans. Or you can talk about incumbency gerrymandering. And in incumbency gerrymandering, the lines are drawn to favor the incumbents. Sweetheart deals, as we sometimes call them. I think gerrymandering really works at its worst when individual legislators decide to draw their competition directly out of their district. They target individuals, and they literally box them out so that they can't possibly beat you in the next election. New York State Assemblyman Hakeem Jeffries talks about how gerrymandering affected his election bid. You know, I used to live on this block. Oh, really? In 2002, but the lines were redrawn. Most people believe to get me out of the 57th Assembly District. 
I, I mean, I, I'm laughing, yeah. but no, because, what? you know, they've been doing this for a year. Right. I mean, it, it's been a tradition. Oh, that's what happened. This, this now this is, is a different, different district. district. Yeah. Just right here. Just right here. Well, if you walk back down the block, I was elected to the New York State Assembly in November of 2006. Prior to that, I had challenged the incumbent uh, of 20 plus years in both 2000 and 2002. The incumbent, Roger Green, was a longtime insider in the Brooklyn Democratic machine. I had no prior political experience, no name recognition, no money in the bank. Uh, probably only two people in the district whose support I could count on myself uh, and my wife. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we had secured over 40 percent of the vote and shocked the Brooklyn Democratic political machine as well as the establishment. Hakeem figured he would run again in 2002. What he forgot was that intervening was redistricting. And the map that was drawn was absolutely fascinating. They drew a map that literally carved out the block on which Hakeem Jeffries lived from Assembly District 57. I remember shaking my head in disbelief. There were a lot of people hoping to vote for me, but were surprised to find that they no longer lived in the assembly district that they had been living in for years, if not decades. Brooklyn politics can be pretty rough, but that move was gangster. Barack Obama is, is quite fascinating. He first runs for Congress from a solidly black neighborhood and gets defeated, gets walloped by uh, a black incumbent. So in 2000, if you're voting for Congress and you live two blocks away from the Obamas, you can vote for then State Senator Obama if you wish. Come 2002, you can no longer vote for Obama. Barack Obama's been removed from the district. Obama then does something very interesting. His backers, the people who think that he has a future, redistrict his seat in a way that gives him a heavily white liberal constituency. One day in the spring of 2001, he sat down at a computer with sophisticated mapping software and began the process of, of redrawing his own, his own district. And that redistricting um, uh, really was a huge turning point in, in Obama's political career. District in 2000 ran across the south side. In 2002 now, he's got a very tasty chunk of lakefront running from the south all the way up through downtown to an area known as the Gold Coast. And it's a particularly nice district if you plan to run for further office. Without that redistricting, he may not have been a real contender in that U.S. Senate race. This is a classic case of inside baseball. Once people know how the game is played, they think it's rigged. But this is what happens when the politicians themselves are designing their districts. They decide what districts they would like. That's not really democracy, that's uh, coronation. Census numbers are important because they are used to figure out how much federal money goes to each state, like funding for school lunch programs and building new hospitals and highways. These numbers also determine how many congressional representatives each state gets. For example, Arizona and Nevada will each get a new member of Congress, whereas Illinois and Michigan will lose a representative. This means a potential increase or decrease in political power for your state. When the 2010 census numbers were first released in December, one of the biggest stories was the growth of the Latino population. The U.S. saw a 9% increase in its total population from the last census count in 2000, and more than half of that growth came from the Latino community. More than 50 million Latinos now live in the U.S. So which states gain new seats and which states lost? And why does the growth in the Latino population matter? What we learned today is that Texas is the big winner. It's going to gain four congressional seats. Florida is going to gain two seats. And then Arizona, Georgia, South Carolina, Utah, Washington, and Nevada will each gain an additional congressional district. That means a shift from states that tend to vote Democratic to states that are more Republican. In fact, uh, based on the census, uh, states that voted for John McCain in 2008 will get six more electoral votes in 2012, and those that voted for Barack Obama will get 
half a dozen less. But the Washington Post's Ezra Klein says not so fast. They may be gaining seats now, but those increased voters aren't going to be voting red. A lot of these changes are driven by Hispanic immigrants. Texas gets more seats now, but the way it's getting those seats brings us closer to the day when Texas becomes a viable target for Democrats. Same goes for Arizona, and that's a state where Hispanics are getting increasingly radicalized against the GOP. California was pushed from being a swing state to being a solidly Democratic state by the Latino population. Colorado and Florida were pushed from Republican-leaning states to being swing states, especially Florida. And if you look at uh, the nine states where the Latino population more than doubled, one of the important ones is North Carolina. That Latino vote helped Barack Obama carry North Carolina. Politico talked to University of Minnesota researcher Eric Ostermeyer, who looks at the bigger picture. The implications for Congress, Ostermeyer said, all depend on how these districts are carved. The mere fact that Republican-leaning states are gaining seats does not automatically mean an extra seat for the GOP. In some cases, once solidly majority white districts could become majority Latino. That's one of the consequences of the growth in minority populations far outpacing that of whites. Hispanics and Asians grew at roughly 43% in the past decade, blacks at 11%, and whites at just 1.2%. The state of Texas has seen phenomenal growth over the past decade, 65% of which came from the Latino population. Based on those numbers, there's a push among advocates to increase Latino political representation. They're advocating for the creation of districts that have Latino majorities, from the local level all the way up to congressional seats. The Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund, or MALDEF, has taken a leadership role in ensuring fair district lines for Latinos. Nina Perales, MALDEF's litigation director, says these boundaries have a huge significance for her community. With respect to city council seats, where the ability to have one or more Latino city council members makes a difference in terms of where parks are located, where recreation space is, uh, how trash is picked up, code enforcement, you name it, even responding to uh, natural disasters. We have our share of natural disasters here in Texas, and when a flood comes to a locality where even some of the relief trucks are parked can can be driven by how much representation there is for Latinos on the city council. Lydia Camarillo is the vice president for the Southwest Voter Registration Education Project in San Antonio, Texas. She says her group will use the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which protects the rights of minority voters, to ensure her community gains their share of majority Latino districts. During the last census count and then the redistricting process, there could have been a majority Latino seat drawn in Dallas as a result of the Latino growth, unfortunately, that didn't take place. Uh, and so we know for a fact that Dallas should be gaining a Latino seat as well as the San Antonio area, and we think Houston. Camarillo says her group has been engaging directly with local communities to draw fair district lines for Latinos, but it hasn't been easy. As you know, everything takes resources to be fully engaged, uh, while at the same time, the community is busy in fighting 63 or better anti-immigrant uh, bills, as well as several voter ID bills, not to mention the cuts on education. So the communities in Texas that are dealing with people of color and working poor are struggling to figure out how they maintain some of the uh, quality of life issues while at the same time trying to draw lines because they know that it means two things. It means representation and electing a member of their choice, whichever level it might be, local, state, and national, as well as resources brought federally uh, and statewide to their communities if, it's, if the lines are not drawn in a way that reflect the growth of the population and the diversity of the state and the communities that we're discussing. There's also the challenges posed by incumbents. In Texas, Republicans control both the Assembly and the Senate. And because Texas's redistricting is done by the legislature, the Republican Party has the advantage. Undoubtedly, they'll try to increase their power base by drawing districts in their favor. But challenges will be made by Democrats and other advocacy groups. Lydia Camarillo says, at the end of the day, compromise is key. From the civil rights community's perspective, we know that the only way to gain is to agree amongst ourselves and have unity maps. And so I think the way that we should be working uh, 
to get there is to first decide what is it that we want within ourselves. In other words, what does the African-American community want? What does the Asian community want? Are there opportunities for um, coalition drawn seats as well as their own uh, majority, whoever we're speaking of, African-American, Asian, or Latino? So that will be the first challenge. The next challenge is to make sure that we work politically, legislatively, and through the courts, a process that allows us to make sure that we have representation. Our goal at the end of the day is not to end up in the courts to accomplish this, but if we have to go to the courts to make sure that the communities, and certainly the Latino community, is represented, we will be there. Demographers agree that the growing Latino population will increasingly exert influence in coming years and decades. The Census Bureau estimates that by 2042, the U.S. will be majority-minority, meaning people of color will make up the majority of the country. Camarillo says population and demographic changes will clearly affect Texas politics, but right now it's uncertain just how the process will play out. Because Texas is going to continue to grow and it's going to continue to be more Latino and more communities uh, that are diverse, then it also means that the state will ultimately be a purple state if the growth continues to be at the level that it should be. Now, there is there is a question about how fast and how soon will Texas be purple. Part of the reality for Texas is that because the Latino electorate is very, very young, a good portion of its population is under 18. But every year in the Southwest, a million more Latinos turn 18, and they're American citizens, and groups like ours and other groups around the state and around the southwest are going to work very diligently to make sure that they're registered to vote and they decide who will govern them and how they will be governed through their vote. In many parts of the U.S., particularly the southwest, anti-immigrant sentiment has transformed into anti-Latino racism. That adds another layer of racial politics to the redistricting process. But Camarillo says people need to keep in mind that Latinos are simply trying to live the American dream, just like everyone else. There is a sense that the growth of the Latino community and other communities of color uh, is not giving the white voters and the white community their place in history, which is a wrong way to look at it. You know, we're growing, but the Latino community is interested in educating its population, in learning the language, in uh, working, in building the infrastructure, because the Latino community is very diverse. It's not just a reflection of one country, but it reflects many, many countries. It wants to see uh, its community respected and treated with dignity, educated, and every opportunity that the rest of the country has, it wants to be able to exercise that right. We'll be right back. Listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. If you'd like more information or for CD copies of this program, please call 800 529 5736. Because of listeners like you, this show is distributed for free to radio stations in the U.S., Canada, and South Africa. To find out how to support us, download shows, or get our podcasts, go to radioproject.org. We now return to Redrawing Lines of Power, Redistricting 2011. Another highly controversial aspect of the redistricting process is known as prison-based gerrymandering. In most states, prisoners are not allowed to vote while they're in prison, but they are counted as bodies for census purposes. On top of that... Those prisoners are counted where they are imprisoned, not their legal residence before serving time. Critics of prison-based gerrymandering say this practice distorts the redistricting system by giving more power to districts with large prisons. It also takes influence away from the communities in which the prisoners came from. Peter Wagner is the executive director of the Prison Policy Institute, a group that documents the impact of mass incarceration and advocates for improved criminal justice policies. In New York State, almost all of the state's prison cells are located in the upstate region, yet more than half of the prisoners come from New York City. So when you credit 
New York City's prisoners to upstate legislative districts should give extra influence to this upstate region. And in New York, there were seven New York State Senate districts that would not have met the minimum population requirements without using the prisoners as padding. So in the case of New York, some of the districts that were the most supportive of extending the prison boom and opposing repeal of these harsh Rockefeller drug laws were given extra influence in the legislature just because they happened to contain prisons in their districts. There's another example of prison-based gerrymandering that gets a lot of attention. It's in Anamosa, Iowa, the small town where a man won a city council seat with just two write-in votes. He wasn't a candidate, but his wife and a neighbor voted him into office. And so he got as much political power as if he was representing 1,400 people when actually he represented only a handful of people who lived next to a large prison. So how did the residents of Anamosa respond when they realized what happened? There was actually a large movement was started. There had been people criticizing this practice of what we now call prison-based gerrymandering for about 15 years. But in Anamosa, um, a petition went around to change the form of government, to end the prison districts, and to actually change how all the districts were drawn in, in the city as a result of this. And... Um, I kind of like the happy ending in Anamosa because when this petition went around, one of the first people to sign the petition was Danny Young, the accidental city councilor, because he said, this doesn't make any sense that I should get extra influence just because I live next to a large prison. And are there other examples of local residents taking on the challenge of demanding change? Yeah, there's two kinds of campaigns that have really become very popular. One is in small rural communities like Anamosa. People, when they recognize that prisons are being used to dilute their right to vote in their local government, they almost without exception rise up and tell the legislature that you have to change course, you have to draw districts without using the prison populations. And almost universally, the local city council or the, or the county legislature agrees. At the state level, though, it's sometimes sometimes gets a little bit more controversial, even though the numerical impact is smaller. In New York, we just completed a um, five or six year campaign to change how the legislative districts are drawn in New York. And there are some of our opponents there are actually trying to organize a lawsuit to try to stop enactment of the new law that's going to end prison based gerrymandering in that state. So why is there opposition to reforming prison based gerrymandering practices? The resistance sometimes comes from a fear of upsetting the status quo because there's a kind of a traditional way in which people argue about legislative districts. Um, if we draw the lines this way, then my party will dominate. And so challenging the data is sometimes not welcome. And it's also just sometimes there's just kind of the real kind of logistical hurdle to show legislators that it's not only desirable, to fix the Census Bureau's prison miscount, it's also quite possible and straightforward. And so it's a real kind of important struggle to get legislators to focus on this question in a timely way. And now, as I mentioned, that the redistricting data is just starting to be released now. We have to act very quickly because some states have to redistrict in the next few months. Other states wait about a year. The policy to count prisoners where they're incarcerated came from the Census Bureau. Why do they choose to count prisoners this way? The Census Bureau has been doing this for more than 200 years since the first census. And to be honest, it probably made sense 200 years ago when the census was only used um, for the purposes of apportionment. So as long as the Census Bureau got someone in the right state so they could figure out the relative populations of New York versus, say, New Jersey in order to determine how many seats in Congress each state got, that was fine. It didn't matter whether someone was counted at home in Brooklyn or upstate in Attica as long as they were counted in the correct location. But now, it's only been in the last 30 or so years that we use census data for redistricting and that we need really detailed data about where it is in each state that people come from. So how did the Census Bureau realize that counting prisoners this way is a problem and what are they doing to address this issue? This issue was only really discovered shortly before the last census and a number of advocates put it out into um, the media as a problem that people should look at. And I wrote a report in 2002 that identified how prisons in the census was distorted in the New York State's legislative redistricting process. So it was only about the real middle of this decade that the Census Bureau became aware of the problem. And to the Census Bureau's credit, it was too late to even consider changing where people in prison were counted for this census that just completed. But what they did have time to do is change how the data is published. What the Census Bureau's agreed to do is to publish the prison counts at the actual correctional facilities earlier than they usually did so that when counties and states are drawing legislative district lines, they can actually be sure, using data from the census, that they are in fact looking at a prison in their redistricting data and they can take that into account. Peter, are there states that have successfully reformed prison-based gerrymandering practices? 
Three states, Maryland, Delaware, and New York, passed legislation. They're going to take the Census Bureau's prison count data, combine it with their own information about where people in prison come from, put it together, and they're going to draw districts based on people being counted at their home addresses. Let's listen to a clip from a press conference that was held in February 2010 when several members of the New York State Legislature spoke out in favor of reforming prison-based gerrymandering practices. This clip features Senator Neil Breslin, who represents Albany. This is a question of fairness. It's a question of right and wrong. Prisoners are kept on the average of 34 months. They go back to where they came from, where their roots are, where their parents are, where their children, their spouses are. They don't stay in the rural communities of upstate New York. And when we say that there's 34 percent from the upstate area, there's 66 percent from farther away in New York City. They should go back to where they should be counted, to where they belong, to where they live. And unfortunately, these rules were devised when the upstate communities, in many instances, saw a benefit to counting them upstate and not where they belong. So I urge us as a legislature to do the right thing. Thank you very much. And we're back speaking with Peter Wagner, the executive director of the Prison Policy Institute. And as you mentioned, the New York State Legislature passed a law banning prison-based gerrymandering in August of 2010. Can you talk about some of the problems they faced in passing this law? The challenges in New York, I think, were overcoming just some of the kind of partisan gridlock and upstate versus downstate tensions in New York and kind of showing people that this was an issue that benefited everyone. If you didn't live next to the state's largest prisons, you benefited from this. And really kind of putting in the fore the struggles of rural people to solve prison-based gerrymandering in their rural counties. We discovered that there's 13 counties in upstate New York that refuse to engage in prison-based gerrymandering. So we kind of pointed those examples out to some of the upstate representatives. And also pointing out that there was uh, two cities that were almost like Anamosa. There were two cities where city council seats were half prisoners. So if you happen to live next to the prison, you got twice as much of a say over the future of Rome, New York, for example, than someone who lived in a different part of the city. So continuing to emphasize how prison-based gerrymandering hurts almost everyone in the state is part of what allowed that, that bill to succeed. And what other states are taking action to address this issue? There's a couple of states. Colorado has a law that requires um, local counties to remove the prison populations before redistricting. And there's a bill in Virginia that's currently pending that's going to extend that to a number of other counties. Some of the states that are looking at various kinds of solutions to prison-based gerrymandering in this round right now are Rhode Island, Connecticut, Illinois, Oregon, Minnesota, Texas. And from what I understand, redistricting is happening as we speak. So what can political leaders and local residents do to make sure that prison-based gerrymandering gets addressed properly? There's a couple of things they can do. One is that elected officials really need to talk to the Census Bureau about how they want people in prison counted. The Census Bureau is sometimes a little bit slow to respond, but they very much want to be America's data source. Elected officials need to be in touch with the Census Bureau about how they think the 2020 census should be conducted. And the time to have that conversation is not in 2019 or early 2020. It's now in the next year that we really think this, these elected officials should be talking to the Census Bureau. And then more immediately anyone who lives in a legislative or county district or school board district whether an elected official or as a citizen needs to be involved in the districting process and when you see these proposed maps ask the question are there prison populations in these districts did you base these legislative districts around prison populations peter wagner is the executive director of the prison policy institute we'll link to their website on our site radioproject.org peter thanks so much for speaking with us today thank you that's it for this edition of making contact special thanks to the green film company For a CD copy of this program, call the National Radio Project at 800-529-5736 or check out our website at radioproject.org to get our podcast, download past shows, or help make a difference by supporting our work. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. Golden Gate.
Gate University is proud to host a benefit featuring California Senator Mark Leno and Assemblywoman Speaker Pro Tempore Fiona Ma at Dignity in Schools Beyond the Numbers of the School to Prison Pipeline, Community Conversations. California faces a crisis of students not completing high school and a large portion of students who do not 